So, induction and inductive phase. And I, I hope slash promise to get back to type groupoids by doing this. But I, as I thought about how to present it, I couldn't find a better way than to start without anything interesting, non groupoid methods, and then make it groupoid. Okay, so induction, I think we're trained on, whether we learn it well or not. There's various things that you learn with you. You know, you start with something like every triangle has 180 degrees, and therefore all n gons have some formula, and you do some induction principle. And you split that up into two principal pieces. There's usually some kind of base case, and then there's an induction hypothesis, and then you get the conclusion is that for all n, fact follows. Right? So, of course, there's a lot of hidden gaps in this model, which is that somehow you have to think of your base case as being enumerated, so that you can think of what base case means, and then the induction hypothesis is advancing what's being enumerated, and usually in classes that are undergrad, we just teach it as the enumerator is the natural numbers. That turns out not to be enough to do most of math. So there's other types of induction where you have some sort of base cases, plural, and as long as you kind of get down far enough in some lattice and you handle all these base cases, then there's some moving up the lattice. The lattice or the post set, and then you get it for all things in the post set. Okay, I'm being vague because if you want, I'll put logic sentences out there, but I think they'll probably just maybe be more mush than useful. Um, this is usually called Noetherian induction. And here is one of my, so this, I'm going to put on my, my, my ranting hat for a second. Um, I think that people often make us sort of teach these kind of recipes of induction and recipes of foundation. Like if you teach people how to do proof by implication and proof by contradiction, somehow induction, that they'll be ready to do math. And the truth is I think that every single type of math has its own set of logical rules that work for them. And they're not uniformly used by everybody else. So Noetherian induction is primarily the parlance of algebraists. You don't see a lot of analysts doing this, even though they could. They just don't. It's just not the kind of induction they need. Um, this kind of induction everybody seems to need, so that's what that's taught off. Okay. Now, each one of these, um, I claim they're just sentences in logic. So in logic, we can start to make them into types. So we take logic to types. That's a path we've tried several times in this seminar. Though not everybody was here for any part of our seminar, so I'm happy to fill in a little bit of digression into that. Then from types, we draw these little diagrams. And then we stand back and we say, what is important about that diagram? Usually it's like a universal mapping property or something like this. And we find a categorical statement. And then we can finally start to justify that this logic is correct by finding models. Models are basically just fancy words for examples. So you build a bunch of examples that have whatever categorical property you want, and then ship that back over here to say that your logic is sound. You haven't made up a logic that's going to lead to inconsistencies and so forth, right? Now this is, um, there's lots of places you can poke holes, but believe me, really smart people have thought about where those poke pressure points are and they have ways to reinforce and make sure that this isn't going to lead to circular logic or things like that. But, but this is a rough technique that's been developed since about the 1900s to about 1950s. The idea of taking logic, refining them into some kind of examples, and then that justifies that the logic is consistent. Okay, sound consistency. And so what I want to do is argue for that in the world of consistent, if I can spell it. I was probably better off just calling it sound. Okay. So I want to do this now with the words induction. Okay? Both with induction as just vanilla standard induction, the piano arithmetic induction, 
and then the more sophisticated Noetherian W type induction. Okay, well founded induction is also in here. So if you get into the books and you hear the word well founded versus well ordered, that's the distinction that's being made. Right, it's just a different type of lattice or post set more generally. Have you ever worked with these on your post sets? I was just thinking, I have like inductive proofs on lattices. I wonder if it's an Ethereum. Yeah, we have to check. But yeah, well founded <coughs> post sets are sort of usually big things like the set of ideals or things like that. You might not be able to have sort of minimal elements to take the base case being the smallest, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you can say that they're minimal in some other general sense, like there's some kind of uh, yeah, atomic level at which you say below here I handle it in case whatever, and um, and well ordering is there's a first one and a next one and a next one and a next one, so and they are not equivalent. There, there are there are models, examples where induction of this kind is strictly stronger than induction of that kind. So even though you had those little papers that said all oh, all inductions are the same, weak induction and strong induction are interchangeable. That's only true if you read induction through the lens of whatever that author is telling you about. So it's not. It's not as general as we now understand induction to be. Okay. Okay, but they're all the same kind of feel of like some dominoes have to fall before all of them fall, right? And as long as you can push enough dominoes at the beginning, that's the base case, and then the induction principle from then on. Okay. So let's do our best now. Uh, actually, maybe I, I will actually just to make sure I, I hit some higher groupoids. Let me try to give a higher groupoid kind of motivation for where 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 does induction start to need some extra facts in here. So we need to back up to something only um, politicians and logicians care about. Okay, There's a phrasing that happens that most mathematicians live on this side of the camp and so they never really encounter it even though they have this problem all the time. Most programmers live on this side of the world and therefore argue about this all the time. Okay. And it's extensional versus intentional. So let me just ask a question. When is a function f from a to b equal to a function g from a to b? What would you tell people? They match on all inputs, little a and big a. OK. So so one idea is that for every A, either of type A or of in A, which I don't care what system of logic you're thinking of yourself right now, but just with some sense of like things in the domain, both F and G have the same domain. And so you'd like them to on equal inputs have equal outputs. Okay. If you're being a little bit more precise, this is this is kind of nice because it's sort of built with one A. But you really actually want something even stronger than that. If A was ever equal to some other A, you'd still want F and G to agree on that. And this starts to tiptoe you into the controversy. Okay. Okay, so the point is here's A, here's A tilde, or A accent, I don't know how you say that. And here apply F to equal inputs, because I said they were equal, but they have different symbols. Okay? And you might say, okay, I don't know what you mean. Okay, make it precise then. Okay, so two things that are equal, but definitely different data, and then pass them to two functions that are supposed to be equal and have them become the same values out. Okay? And now you can start to see how it is that you're going to be able to create a situation where people will disagree with your definition. Because Along comes a programmer and says, well, look, uh, let's say that these are restricted to, say, natural numbers, just so that I can make the sentence I want to give right now. So it's the identity function on natural numbers, okay? And I'm going to compare it to a function on natural numbers that does the square root of x squared. Right? Now, they output the same value, but are they the same program? And if, you, if they are the same program, 
notice that a lot of things are going to be quite different. The time it takes to run G, so time for F is much, much less than the time to compute G. Okay? You could get into accuracy. Well, then that maybe you would say, well, then we're not really using the natural numbers. We're using some kind of floating points. Well, still, there's a technical difference, right? The actual number of steps is not the same as the steps in G. And so with things that you can clearly see are discernibly different, you start to ask yourself, should we not have allowed ourselves some distinction between these F and Gs? But they're not actually equal to each other. They're kind of become equivalent when your lens, you zoom out, and your lens is this high scale lens. So is it like a question of equivalence of action of the function versus what it is? Like right, so this vocabulary is by Constance Jones, and she, she justified it with Constance. I don't know if that's how you still her name. Something like that. It, I think, uses the same alphabet. So we at least are in the right ballpark. Okay? So Constance Jones, she uh, invented this vocabulary a while back, and, that, and the, the reasons were local to her generation of, of logicians. We now use them in our language. So I'll, I'll give what she justified them with, and then I'll say what I think people think now. So extension is all the things, all the properties that would be true of the whole topic. What extends to the whole topic area? So if I want to talk about real numbers, what's true about all real numbers? What extends that? Intention is, what did you mean by this step? So it's local versus global information. Now, if you look carefully, I think that the language has deviated over the years to largely become computational differences versus sort of set theoretic differences. And in the world of set theory, there's even an axiom called the axiom of extension. So set theory says, if I have a set, so this is an axiom of um, extensionality. If S is a set, then there is a property such that S is equal to those things that satisfy the property. Okay. Doesn't tell you how to get the property, right? It's an axiom, right? So it doesn't like say, oh, here's why. It just says, there is one, good luck. And that's great if you're a mathematician, then you know that you're in a set if you satisfy some property, okay? Um, but that, that is out of the sky, and that's not going to satisfy your typical programmer who has to actually go program, give me the property that S satisfies. You know, I don't know why things are in S. You didn't tell me what S, I don't know. You, like, either you gave it with property, and so like your classic examples of the difficulty that go on here, if I'll move over here. So here's um, two sides of the same coin. Suppose that I have some lines in just R2, okay? And I think of shading all these values in here, okay? So that's my set F. F is the set of all vectors in R2 where, um, V is uh, constrained by linear equations. And you can write that down as a linear program, so you have some matrix A times V is less than or equal to B. Okay? For those of you who've done linear programming, you've seen thousands of those. Okay? Now this is a perfectly reasonable set to a set theorist. It's giving me the property of what it means to be in there. right? Um, and so you should be able to, from this, discern, you know, you don't even need this axiom of extensionality, it should be able to do all set typey things. Well, there's another axiom of set theory, I think it's called the axiom of foundation, though the names I always slip on. So, axiom and set theory is that a set is defined by its elements. That's not how we write it. We say that A is equal to B if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. But what that's trying to say without symbols is, if you tell me its elements, you've told me the set. Now, what's a set? What's an element in the set? If I ask for a vector in F, I mean, you told me the set is defined by its elements, but I mean, I'd have to do some work. I'd have some at least some arithmetic left to go find actual points in here. 
And it turns out that problem by itself is as hard as all linear programs, just deciding if the set is not empty, right? Just deciding if there's a point in that space is as hard as solving a linear program. If you do this over the integers instead of the reals, that'd be NP complete. And that's how hard this question is. So now, okay, you could say it's still solvable because you could exhaust all the natural numbers and see which ones are in there. But you're starting to step away from the, the reality of do axioms buy you something that's real life? Like if you just assume it's got elements, do you really have a justification that you can explain to your grandmother that she should believe in set theory? Right? This doesn't feel like a model of her world where she can just reach into this F and pick a point in, this, in that constraint equation. Right? So there is reason to doubt that this is the right place to start. But now we compare it to a different set C. This is ultimately what? Triangle, right? And so I could draw a simplex, just the standard simplex. I think this one's called delta 2. So somebody's going to have to help me out because I don't remember how to do this stuff. But it's these guys such that what? X plus Y plus Z is less than or equal to 1. And these guys are in the interval. Is that the standard simplex? Okay. Yeah. And then there's a function, a linear function in fact, some matrix that will send the standard simplex to wherever this is in space. Okay. And so C is just the image of this. And it's easy to create things on the standard simplex, right? You just pick something between 0 and 1. You pick another thing that's between 0 and 1 that doesn't add beyond it. Just X, Y, Z. You can iterate that all day long. You can make thousands of points on this. You can dither that all you want. And then you apply this matrix M, and you get the points inside that triangle. Now they're the same set, according to set theory, right? This is the one defined by its elements. This is the one defined by some constraint. But only set theory would say those are the same computationally. right? A programmer would have totally different jobs on their hands. If this was the set you gave, why on earth would you know what constraint it satisfies? You can create as many elements all day as you want out of it. But to know what are the boundaries, what, what makes it in or not in the set, is work to be done. Up here, you can check all day long what's in the set and you have no idea, sorry, if something's in the set, if you were given something in the set, you have no idea how to sample from the set without work to be done. Okay, so there's a, there's a separation that's happening, and that's the tension that's here. Most mathematicians have been trained on this side of the world. But as we're finding, it turns out in a marvelous way, this side of the world, which is enormously useful if you plan to use your stuff on any kind of computation, is coming straight out of a lot of models and categories. A lot of category theory is actually, in its natural sense, on an intentional side of theory. And so what it's allowing us to do is to take ideas that we've proven for sets and slide them over to the people who have computational goals. One of the most exciting ones would be known to a topology community like you all are The higher homotopy groups of spheres. Now, it's easy to define this thing, right? But which kind of a set are we looking at when we describe that definition of higher homotopy group? Is it that you have an easy way to come up with elements in the higher homotopy group, or that you just have a way of deciding when it is in the higher homotopy group? So, what is the higher homotopy group? It should be functions from SK into, sorry, from SN into SK up to homotopy classes, right? I don't know, is this notation you guys use? I don't know which notation you might have used. That's my function for the homotopy classes of continuous functions from SK to SN to SK. So F is SN to SK is continuous, and then I mod out by homotopy. That's my SN, SK notation. Better notation probably exists. That's the only one I know. Okay. Using this like a base point. Oh, I guess, yes, you're right. Um, I guess it's the group point I give you rather than the base point version. Sorry about that. Grow the D. Influence me a little bit. So. It's connected, right? So you can make any choice you want. 
Anyway, what kind of set is this? Is it where I know how to sample, but I maybe don't know the constraints? Or I know what it means to be in the set, but I don't necessarily know a single element in it? Or all the elements in it? I think it's the top kind, right? I mean, there is one, the trivial, you can track it, but, but outside of that trivial point, you don't know if there's higher homotopy groups. Do they vanish? What do they do? What do they have Zmod 2s in there? And if you've seen the hot vibration, you know you can have surprises, right? So, am I, do you guys know? I don't know what you guys know. We're doing the hot vibration soon. <laughs> okay, so, so watch out. <laughs> this is a weird thing. It, it, if you did this with something like S1, okay, so here we have S1, and we put a beach ball on there, we try to roll it around continuously, what's going to happen? There's like no way to put a circle, I mean a, a basketball, onto this hoop. It'll go through the hoop maybe, but it won't go into the hoop, right? It's just, that's not topologically possible. Okay? There's no interesting way to do that except to put it on a point, contract it away. But somehow, you bump up in dimension. I don't know how to draw a three sphere, but there's my three sphere. Just kind of think double vision. It's my best attempt at this. And you map that onto a regular two sphere. And there's some awfully tricky, cool things that you can do. And one of them is not contractible. At least, well, one class of them, one homotopy class, is not contractible. It's not the same as just putting it on a point. They, you, the ball will not fall into the circle, but the triple ball will fall into the sphere. And that's just God yeah. trying to mess with you. So, so it's like the Hoff vibration is a continuous map from the three sphere to the two sphere, such that the pre image of every point is a circle. And if I remember correctly, it's crazy. You right? do this like through CP1 type thing. So yeah. you think of this as living inside of C squared, right? So you think of a of a complex sphere, which would actually be four dimensional, real sphere. So this would be the S3. And you look at the lines through the origin that are the ways to identify the antipodal points in that higher sphere, and it would give you a complex sphere. But that one, because of things you can do, is just uh, S2. Mm -hmm. And so then you get this non-trivial, non-contractable. Now, it's not so surprising you make functions like this. But surprising that that one's not contractible. That, that one doesn't just vanish to a point. So I mean, out of all the functions you might invent, finding the one that doesn't contract is what gets your name on it, or got Hop's name. Okay, so that's on the in extensional side though, right? This, this thing had to exist in some sense of like there are points in it, but no recipes for describing. So then the people want to know, could you actually do this in a way that's computational? Because people want to compute these higher homotopies. Not, not just for aesthetic reasons. I'm going to claim, though I don't know if I'll get to it today at all. Maybe we'll put somebody on it. There are computational goals right now inside of compilers that have to deal with solving these problems. And so, if you want to actually try to do this computation, then you need to move out of the extensional land where it was easy to write things down and make it all work, because you just invented some hypothetical reason to think that you can tell two, these two sets are equal without any work. Like you said, thou shalt have this truth without knowing why. Now you've got to teach a computer to do that, you've got to fill in the missing gaps. Okay? And in this direction, higher rootoids. And in particular, higher homotopy theory. So homotopy type theory. Are leading in the direction of solving this problem computationally. And to some cases, they've actually have solved it. Like they've proven what they wanted to prove. But I would say that this is still on the more bleeding edge. And there's more to come from this. So I won't call this a, a wrapped up package. But in the last, it's really been 15 years or less, this has come together as showing signs of really working. So that's what I want to sort of hint at, is that this infinity groupoid model is becoming more and more a part of computation and practical needs in computation. Okay. Now, pay attention to your classes. You're going to love this thing. So, and then there's this like bot periodicity that's going on. It's just stuff that blows your mind. So here's what you would love to be able to do inside of a computer to be able to create this question. You want to be able to program a sphere. How would you program a sphere? 
I mean, like this, the question writ large is right on the board, right? So like, go ahead. Tell me what you're going to write down to write this question down. I mean, we know what a sphere is. Come on, this is easy. This is child's play, right? You go from x0 to xn, and then you just do a distance formula. Right? Done. And then, and then that somehow you're going to put in a computer, this infinite set with infinite precision of things. And then you're going to map a function that's continuous. Probably swap the order of things here. Maybe I'll just go down. There you go. OK. And you're going to come up with a way to model continuous functions, all of them, all uncountably many of them. And then you're going to factor out homotopy as an equivalence relation, as one does when you program. And, uh, and then you're going to compute a presentation of that group. And now anybody who's done any computing knows that every single thing I just mentioned is impossible, down to even computing a presentation of something. That's even a provably undecidable. It's one of the first undecidable theorems ever proved. You can't find a presentation of a monoid. Okay, so, so there are just every single question in this question, every sub-question in this question is not doable. Okay, so and yet it's being done, and that's because this has nothing to do with how you ask the question. Let's define a sphere without points. Well, let me be careful. Let's define a sphere without an ambient space. Every good topologist knows they're supposed to think of like a manifold as just living, but not living in something. But we all do some version of Whitney's embedding theorems, right? We all kind of say, well, it kind of lives inside of a bathtub. So there it is floating around, OK? Like, but we don't really honor the truth of a topological set just existing without three pieces around it, OK? And that's what we have to honor if we're going to try to move to the intentional side of things, OK? So here's what we're going to do. A circle. Let's make S0. That one I can do computationally. Right, what's S0? Just plus and minus one. I can do that. Right, two points. Easy, easy. Okay. In particular, though, something is hiding right here in front of us. X and Y are not equal. X is equal to itself, Y is equal to itself, but X is not equal to Y. So we start to see the value of thinking of the word equality, or what we saw as these Martin-Moff identity types entering into the picture of that's going to be a key component of what we do. S1. S1 you could think of as a bunch of points. But when we draw a picture, we draw one point and then a single one cell. Does that look right? And that's why we don't really care about where this lives, because that one cell, it could be this one or it could be that one. I mean, draw it however you want. It's just this one other cell. It's other points, wherever they are in your mind, don't matter because they're not relevant to the definition of being a sphere. Okay, And uh, a higher sphere, here you can build some different cells for it. Right? Actually, you can do different cells for, for this too. You can put two points in and put a hemisphere and a hemisphere. Right? You can put many other things, as long as you have one model. right? But each one has, at least at some point, a notion of a one cell. And that one cell, you don't really have points in between. It's just connecting these edges. I mean, these vertices, these lower order cells, right? So you don't think, you think of it as an entire cell, an entire creature of its own kind at a higher level than the points that you have, okay? And a sphere, S2, could be the same thing. You could have, maybe you do like a circle, and then you put a hemisphere, and then a hemisphere, two, two cells, or you might just do a one point compactification style thing, where it's just one, two cell wrapped onto that, okay? But in any event, there's, the notion of the points you're going to deal with, where you have notions of like x equals x, or x doesn't equal y, but like concrete points, and then you have the cells, and they are sort of relating outside at a higher level. They don't have subpoints inside of them, not part of the cell complex. And that you can actually program. I'll write the way you write the program in a syntax that's been promoted by the people developing this. I think this goes to Dan Licata. Um, but uh, it looks like this. S1 will have a base of that point here. Let me erase my circle inside the circle here so you don't confuse this with something like a wedge of S1s. 
That's my base. Okay. This outside cell, I'm going to name loop. It kind of looks like a loop. Okay. Where does loop go? Well, it's a new type of thing to throw into S1. It's a new introduction rule. So I'll put an OR symbol. This Schaefer stroke is called an OR in, in this kind of syntax. Okay. So if you've done any kind of grammars, anybody here? Anybody done Bach Norris grammars or anything like that? A parser class? Look, compiler, okay, so lost for all of you. But there's there's this language of writing grammars down where you put four strikes in. So you'll say like you want a tokenizer. You want to say what's a token? So maybe plus is a token and minus is a token and division is a token and all the different things you could type in, and then it'll help you create a, a language out of it. Here's loop. Okay. That's the basic idea here. Is I get out a base or a loop. But these are untyped, so they don't really carry any information, they're just names. So now I'm going to add the types of what these things are. This is a term of type S1. It's an actual point on the set, if we want to think of it as that. Okay? Now we want to add the entire loop as another set of things, but not as actual points. So it would be wrong. Though certainly it seems like the first thing you tried, I wouldn't be surprised if this was the first thing you tried. I'll have to ask. Um, so one of the persons involved in making this uh, is our friend Mike Schulman, and so he might actually know the history of this. This was invented at Opel Bullfuck about 11 years ago. The loop S feels like okay. I'm making more points on the circle. Okay, but that's not right because we don't want to think of these as individual points. We want to think of it as the whole loop. And when you think about what the loop is doing, at the end of the day, all it has to do to be a circle's loop is connect the base to the base. So it's a function from base to base. It's a function from base to base. It's very close. Except it's not really a function. Imagine that you now live on this circle. and You're an ant. You could stay at base to base. So this one here, just by being a point, says that I have the reflexive law as proof that I'm equal to myself. As a point in S1, I am myself. Everybody has the reflexive law. Right? Well, that was one of those things we want law set to do. Always introduce A equals A as a reflexive. And then everything else, transitivity and symmetric, followed by transferring terms. But here, we want to relate base to base in a way that really truly is not the same as having stayed where you were, but having gone around some number of times. And so what you are actually doing is you're introducing more ways to be equal. So now let me back up and write the introduction rules for Martloff identity types and see if we can pinpoint where this is happening. This is all notation, right? Nothing, this is all beautiful notation. But it's just notation for a cool idea. So yes, I'm here. Like, so this is some way of, this is supposed to be a CW complex, right? So a way of programming a CW complex? Uh, but without all the axioms of the CW complex. So, like, when you think of this circle as a CW complex, you start with a point, and then you, start, and then you have a an edge, a closed edge, a disk, yeah. a one dimensional disk. It has an it has endpoints, it has two points, endpoints. But you put a policy on a CW complex. Do you have the closed weak property, right? You have to have a topology already on the space in order to do that. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is synthesizing a topology as it's making the space. Okay, but it's not clear to me how you would do like say a torus. Um because uh, then you start with the point. I can't do a torus. I can't do a torus, but I can't do it off the top of my head. But yeah, it, it, I can do a CW complex out of the torus. Like I would, I would be doing it. Actually, I can't do it out of, off the top of my head. Now that I'm thinking about it, I take the universal cover, right, the whole R two, and I identify that with that, roll it, which I can do with with a higher inductive type, and then I roll it this way, which I can do with another higher inductive type. The higher inductive type is going to say, I need a path that says this is equal to that. So it'll be a higher order saying well, this row of lines is equal to that row of lines. And then the same way over here. 
you're starting out with the universal covering? Well, I'm not starting out with the universal <laughs> covering, right? I'm starting out with a single two cell. Okay. So, I mean, I'll show you. L let me say, this is how it's supposed to work. I've never put that up in cock or something to see that I'm correct. Mm -hmm. So let me let me say that with a yeah, with an right. ounce of doubt or a right. big spoonful of doubt, maybe. Yeah. Okay, but the philosophy is in there. Now let me back out and do something related to this because I think it'll be easier to follow how this this is the goal, and then the the goal after this is to then actually create pi n of s k and go off and compute. That's like that's the the synthetic homotopy goal is can we compute some of this stuff just the same way that we've been computing with things in other types of math instead of having people spend entire PhDs trying to find the next homotopy group or whatever maybe this is a machine's job and if we can open our world of computing to this kind of computing maybe we'll compute a lot of other things too not just I mean this is a test bed where we already have some ways to know if we're doing it right because we've computed some higher homotopy groups we know some of those spheres right we know some properties so we can test if we're coming out correctly if you come out with, with pi 3 s2 isn't z mod 2, you've got a prop buck, right? Because we know that. So, so the work is headed in the direction of, of improving what we can compute with. Making more extensional goals become more intentional. That's the, the way that people are saying it. That's the language, okay? So, so let me back up. Related question. So this is the first example of a higher inductive type, but it's only an example in lowercase e kind of sense, because what I did is hid behind notation saying, this will eventually make sense. So it's an example without any content, and I recognize that. But it's certainly compact, right? You can just start writing things like this. So it's certainly a nice kind of get the ethos of it, okay? Um, what is this thing? polynomials mod x squared plus 2. How would you tell a computer to work with this guy? How do you tell yourselves to work with this guy? Okay, I'm going to back up. Well, I'd say this is a polynomial, right? Is yeah. it? Okay, go ahead, Tristan. Uh, x cubed equals minus 2. That's like x cubed equals minus 2. Or that x is this is q adjoining the cube root of minus two, right? Right. It's a field. It's some field inside of the complex numbers, some field of the complex numbers. I mean, there's lots of ways you can think about this, right? You can write down matrices that do this three by three matrices that multiply like this. There's a lot, lots of goals, right? Okay. So at, at the end of the day, there's three kind of classic things people do. There's the partition model in a math class. I don't think any of us actually do this, by the way. But in a math class, we could say, well, obviously, this just means this, right? So that's roughly the definition, and it gives you no content. It gives you no sense for how big or small this is, you no properties of it. So while that is the set, it's not really a useful interpretation of the set, right? So you can back up and say, well, I'm going to just do algebra with the implied equivalence relation, which is that a of x is congruent to b of x if and only if um, x cubed plus 2 divides their difference, right? And that 2 is legal, but doesn't add that much extra value over the symbols of the first line, right? They're just kind of rewriting the definitions. And the last one is the functional approach which is that, well, I'm not going to bother with that set at all. I'm just going to make a whole morphism into, let's say, 3 by 3 matrices over Q, where I send X to uh, that, okay? And then all linear combinations of that, okay? And then I can say, well, I'm not actually going to work with this, it's just that the kernel of this happens to be that ideal and so I'll just multiply and add matrices, which I do know how to do, and then I'll, but, but that required me to guess this here, right? I mean, I was lucky to know the companion matrix of this polynomial, but if I walked into a situation that had more than one variable, x, y, z's, and some other stuff, 
good luck understanding a way to write down that algebra. You're basically going to have no way to guess what that is. Okay, so you're asking the impossible. But what do we really do in that situation? I claim we don't do any of these three things. do is every time I see an x cubed, I replace it with this other thing. It's just a rewriting rule. Okay? So if I'd be somewhat honest with how I would work with this space, then what I'm really going to have is, let's call this thing A, so I have an for it. I'm going to have A, I'm going to have its addition, I'm going to have its multiplication, a 1, a 0, and then I'm going to have a rewrite rule. The rewrite rule is every time I see an x cubed, I can erase it and put in cube root of minus root 2, or minus 2, and then just follow the arithmetic. It never gets beyond x squared. I just keep rewriting everywhere in the middle of this. You meant x over there, not x cubed. Rewrite x cubed too. Yes, sorry. Every time I see an x, I can replace it with that. And every time I read, this is what I really meant to write. Then. x cubed, I replace it with minus 2. Okay? And every time I see an x cubed, I put a minus 2 in, and I don't worry about everybody else. Everybody else just stays as a polynomial. But under this implicit rewriting rule, that every time I get up to a cube, I replace it with minus 2, and I come back to my tail, right? So I claim this as an example of a higher inductive type, but done in a slightly different way. So what I'm going to have here is that first I have q of x. q of x is just the free algebra on the set with just x in it. Okay? So that's a type. Anything that has a universal mapping property is going to give you some type of type theory. Okay? And so the type is going to look something like this. The free rule says x goes to 3 of x. So that's an intro rule, right? I'm going to create a type called free of x. And the introduction is you give me a little x, it comes here. Okay? The elimination rule. If I have any other function to any other algebra, then there's an elimination rule that tells me how to get out of here. Okay? Implicit in this list of introductions are a couple recursive ones. If I had a u and a v of type f of x, so here, I'll write this introduction rule as x of type x gives me e sub x of type f of x. How about we just do the whole thing over here? So, formation rule. I need a type. You can think of it as a set or a type at the moment. It doesn't really matter. It's some, some initial data type. That will be a new type. It will also be a set. That's, that's not quibble. Introduction rule, we have that one. For every generator, there's some thing in the f of x. I'm going to call it e sub x rather than x. We often call it x, but I want to exhibit the function explicitly that does that. That does the introduction rule. Okay? But implicitly, I also have these. If u and v are already in the free algebra, then so is u plus v. Okay. If I have u is in the algebra, and um, maybe I also have u and v out of product. And if you want to put scalars by rationals, you could have an introduction where it takes something that's in the polynomial algebra, something that's rational, and then you'd have a way to build an a times b, or an a times x kind of thing, right? So you add to this all these other things. Well, look at this. I mean, this is begging for induction. Because it's saying it's based on some previous cases you've already understood, and then you're adding to this. So by building this type, you're building induction into your system. And to a type theorist, 
the link between induction and free is material. That's a really important link. Anything free is an induction. Induction isn't about any kind of like logical process. It's a data type. It's a data type of a free algebra. The universal mapping property of freeness is induction. So now let's see the elimination rule. The elimination rule said, get me out of here. But given an f. So I have a u of type 3 of x. I have a function from x to some other algebra. This other algebra implicitly has to have all the same kinds of operations. Okay, It's got to have a plus and a times and so forth. right? So we're talking about free in a category of some things. So let's say it's free with a plus just for the plus and a times, just so that I don't have to think about every other operator that's going on here. But you put scalars on there. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to eliminate this and become an element of type A. That's what this says. Get me out of this function into this one. Right? That's the only elimination rule that you can come up with that's trying to be a free algebra. But then comes the computational rule. The computational rule now has to take into account how we got that data. So suppose that I was given x is the way that I got to a u and the function from x to a. What do you think f of e x is going to be? No, not f, elim. The elimination rule of f, um, I'll call it f hat. The program to call this f hat. Sorry, because it's f hat. Okay, that's what I meant to say. There isn't an f of u, right? f is only defined on x. So I'm trying to say there's a new function called f hat that takes that to that. Okay. So what's f hat on this track? What do you do on the basis in the free algebra? What do you do with the polynomial? You have x squared plus 9, and you evaluate x at 7. What do you do with the x? Like plugging in. You plug it in. So it's just f of x. Just apply this input to that one. That's going to give you some number in a. So evaluating the polynomial at x is this, this base case. Where's the recursion? Where's the inductive step? Well, the inductive step is what if I was given two previous values of f? OK, if I was given two previous values, then f hat of their sum is by definition what? The sum of the f. The sum of the f hats done recursively. And so you bake in, as you're doing it, that f hat will be a homomorphism. You don't make a function and then go prove it's a homomorphism. You make the homomorphism as a consequence of making the function. The way the function is even defined, how do we define a function on a vector space? We define it on a basis and then extend it linearly, which is just fancy word for induction. Extending linearly is just applying the induction principle to that inductive type. Now that's a type that you can see a lot with. It hasn't done this though. So we're out of time, but what we'll do, and we should pick some volunteers to do this, is to do an induction where you add in this rewrite as an extra operator. So there'll be an operator here that says, if I give you u's and b's, where one of them has an x cubed, it becomes a minus 2. And that'll be a way to introduce something that now has a minus 2 there instead of it previously had the x cubed. That's a new way to introduce data, is through the rewrite. And you follow through and you realize it just creates a new computation rule. Once you get comfortable with that, and you've been doing it your whole life, you've been rewriting this. Whenever you did quotients, the rest of us, we didn't talk with equivalence classes or partitions or functions to other things. We just replaced x cubed with minus 2. That rewriting has all the functional characteristics of being the mod. If you can do that here, then when we come back to the spheres, I claim that that adding loop from base to base is the same mathematics as what's replacing x cubed with minus 2. It's saying that wherever you run into a loop, you just replace it. You just use it mechanically in the same way. And so therefore, computationally, you can't tell the difference between a sphere created synthetically and a topological sphere, where all you're allowed to do is the topology between them. And if you can't tell the difference, then some mathematicians say those are the same thing. Of course, one is synthetic and one is real. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever real means to you in your mind. Okay. So if, uh, anybody who wants to, you don't have to decide right now, but we should try, try to rotate people in. 
to try to do one of these higher inductive types. And I recommend just doing an example out like this. And I'm happy to help or point you to papers that will help you. And I've lied about some of the things here. I've made it a little bit simpler because I don't want to deal with some of the minutia. But I'm happy to, if somebody wants to dig into minutia, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Okay. So why don't we stop here and you'll let me know what you want to do. So this is a weird thing to me, but this is a higher group weight, it turns out. You added these higher operators, and then you truncate by those higher operators. I don't know how to think of this quotient in the mouth, which really just means you don't see them in the formula anymore. So what's the difference between being able to rewrite and not keeping track of it, and actually having the quotient? The answer is nothing. But it feels aesthetically different. But this one you can teach a computer. You can give it these other rewriting operations, and it actually keeps track of them. And then it just doesn't write them on the screen. Just, this says, just don't report that stuff. And so it feels like a quotient, but it's not actually a quotient at all. It's a rewriting system. But it does it in a higher level of the rewriting, higher in the group weight. It's kind of fun stuff. All right, I will see you all probably next week. If I don't hear from anybody, I'll start poking. Stop recording. Oh.